eternity. We're going to hand our country, our children, our education, our movies to some very evil people. And what we want to stay out of, politics really have become moral issues. It is. If you have any kind of moral fiber, which we all do according to Genesis 3.22, when man sinned, God looked at him and said, now man's going to be like one of us. And they're going to know right from wrong. So don't, don't let anybody tell you that they don't know what they're doing. I don't let anybody come in my office. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, you did. You knew your inward barometer knew that it wasn't right what you did, but you ignored it. That's why no man's going to stand before Jesus with an excuse. All right, let's go on. So notice what he teaches. Jesus teaches something, and this is what he teaches. First thing is you always honor God first. Man, I, I couldn't sleep last night, so I just laid on my bed. And uh, when the anointing, see, the anointing hasn't lifted off of me from NRB, and, and I'm like, God, you know, uh, yeah. Marilyn Hickey always told me, she said, when that anointing gets on you, sometimes, and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier, your body's like, Ugh. you know, so I was just, I was just laying there worshiping God, worshiping God, worshiping God, and my spirit, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to kiss him and, uh, and tell him how much I loved him, but that's called hallowing his name. It's honoring him and reaching out to him and making him a part of your life. You know, one of the greatest things that I love and I, don't, I can't speak for you, but I love in my life is I walk and I feel the presence of God continually. I feel his presence on me. How many of you feel God on you? I, I love it. I wouldn't trade, Lord, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's what I told God about this building. I said, if, you, if your presence don't go with me, I'm not stepping foot in that place. I want you, God. I want your presence and I want people to feel it double what they do here. Man, isn't that awesome? All right, so the first thing you've got to learn how to pray is you've got to learn how to honor God. Now watch this. The next thing he prays, and we always think of this religiously, thy kingdom come. Now stop right there. Do you know there's only two kingdoms? There is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil. And both the kingdom of God and the devil are trying to infiltrate and touch and influence the kingdoms of this world. The problem is you get evildoers that get elected because people, they don't have discernment. And we put a check mark. Evildoers then try to further the kingdom of darkness. This is why it's not hard. You've got the party on the right. I'm not talking about the ridiculous rhinos. But most of the time, the right has been conservatism, right? They've wanted to include God. They wanted the Ten Commandments in the schools. Are you all here? They wanted government to stay out and let we the people. But the left, they kicked God out of their party. And they're now the party of the non-religious. Well, my question is, then what are you aligning with? What's influencing you? Well, look at what they want to do. They want to convince you as parents that you don't have any say regarding if your child comes to you and decides that they want to change their gender. I mean, well, that's evil. Because God said there's only two genders, male and female. They want to tell you that uh, homosexual marriage is somehow endorsed by God. But yet Jesus never mentioned that. He said, you want to know about marriage? Marriage is between one man and a woman. And the reason he said that is because in the, in the, in the order of, of man and woman in marriage, it means that it sets a certain order. A certain boundary so that anything doesn't go. He gave authority to parents so that they could protect their child so that children don't become victims. I mean, we were being, we interviewed Sam Sorbo, Kevin Sorbo's wife, and she said something very bold. She said, they're no longer educating your children in the schools, they're indoctrinating them. And she said, here's the problem. They're trying to continue to put ridiculous material into the hands of your children, pornographic ma material, right? And they don't want anyone to tell them that that's wrong. And here's what's bad about that. What's happening to these children and all this sexual exploitation. Don't think that there isn't wicked agendas that want to lower the consent so that they can sleep with your kids and not call it pedophilia. We better stand up. So when Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 
He wasn't talking about you just pray, oh, thy kingdom come. No, he was literally saying, thy kingdom come, Lord, your kingdom come, and all opposing kingdoms, all wicked kingdoms, all evil kingdoms, and those who cooperate are about to get a purposeful overthrow. Are, are you, that's what it means. I told you in kidding last week when I got married, almost 35 years come up in July, when I got married to Brenda, her kingdom came. And I'm telling you, she's decorated the whole house according to the kingdom of Brenda. And, and I have just like one space. I have my train room and maybe the garage. And then the dog house that, you know, if I get sent there. No, I'm just teasing. She never sends me to the dog house. But here's what I want you to see now. He said, thy kingdom come. When you say thy kingdom come, you are invoking the justice of God. You are asking God to come in his power. Now, here's the problem. Can I tell you what the problem is? It's why even when I said what I said about they're so corrupt that they want to lower the consent, sleep with your children. I saw a couple of you people bristle like you don't believe that. You know why? Because here's the problem. In this particular society, people don't want to address us from our pulpits. We sit there and believe the garbage that's being said to us, and we've got this mentality like it's somebody else's responsibility to figure it out. No, we are the ones. We're Christians. We're the ones that have to set a certain moral standard according to the Scripture. So when you say that kingdom come, you're literally invoking the justice of God in a dark, evil world, and you're doing it for the sake of God and the sake of humanity. That's how serious it is. Now, I want you to look at Psalm 58. Psalm 58. Look at what the Psalms say. Psalm 58. David prayed these prayers. Now, how many believe that all of Scripture is in the inspired Word of God? For whatever reason, the Holy Spirit, He moved upon men, it says in the book of Timothy. They began to write the Scriptures. That's why the, the, the different uh, letters are in here, the different, you know, psalms are all in there. Uh, let me give you an example. Psalm 3 talks about the Lord being our shield. They wrote a song about it, but they omitted a verse. And it's only eight verses long, Psalm 3. And the verse they omitted is this right here, break the teeth of the wicked. They never sing that because they don't believe that somehow that's not the inspired word of God. Or they say, well, that's just Old Testament. Well, why is it in there then? And why in the New Testament, which you're going to see, they reference imprecatory psalms. Psalms that invoke or call on the justice of God. Break their teeth, O oh God. Now, how, how would we pray that today? God, I'm going to do it right now. Father, I pray that you would break and shatter the teeth of those who want to bite down upon our children. Upon children's entertainment. Break and shatter those who lie through the media. God, and those who want to bring about a, a, a foothold and a stronghold that deceives the people. We are asking you to break their lies, break their narratives. And we are calling forth for the Holy Spirit of truth now to touch our media. And to counter every lie and every grip that the enemy would desire to harm innocent people, especially the children. All right? Do you see how you do that? Yes. Now, you say, well, is that, I mean, that's the Psalms. Well, how many remember Jesus on the cross? I mean, he quoted the Psalms. You look at Psalm uh, 31. He said in verse 5, when he was on the cross, his last words, he quoted the Psalms. He said, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he was on the cross, he quoted Psalm 22. Where he said, I'm thirsty. He said, Eli, Eli, lava, sabachthani, however you say it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. So he, he quoted the Psalms. Because we can't just ignore them. We have to understand that they hold a certain place. Not only for worship, but how we should pray. Now, I know some of you might be listening to me today, and those of you that will listen later, you're listening now, you say, well, wait a minute. How can you pray those kind of prayers when Jesus said, love our enemies and pray for those that despitefully use us? Mm -hmm. And you know, that was the problem with Nazi Germany. The Christians, they didn't want to confront Hitler. 
And when Bonhoeffer rose up, a Lutheran preacher, and began to war, warn the sleeping church, they killed him. And look at how many millions of people at the hands of an apathetic church. Because the church and the preachers would not stand up. And the ones that stood up, they killed them. The government did. We have to understand the power that we have as Christians, as the church today, to ward off evil. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, it doesn't mean you'll never have a fight with flesh and blood. Come on. Nancy Pelosi, you don't think that was a fight with flesh and blood? Chuck Schumer, you know that guy, that guy's a uh, little Ben. <laughs> right? Oh, we love Hillary. Listen, I think she's beautiful now. I think she's just a terrific, terrific lady. That's what I think. I think she's, I think she's fantastic. I don't know why he says that. We'll have to talk to him about that. But, but here's the point. The point is there are some wicked people that cooperate with evil spirits. And they have evil agendas to kill, steal, and destroy. Okay, just the fact that the party of the left is so bent on fighting so that women can continue to kill children. And now they don't even want to call it a child. See, that's how you get by with it. So they don't, they, see, they don't, want to, they don't want to deal with the fact that every man has a moral conscience. So to appease that that God put in every human being, oh, let's just not call it a child. And then we won't feel convicted that we're murdering another life. This isn't hard. You are not liking what I'm saying. I, I don't think you are. All right, well, all right, let's go to, let, let me change the subject. Okay, let's go to Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 20, uh, 16. I want to show you the first time where you see this imprecatory. You see this judgment of God. So Peter stands up and he begins to declare, because how many of you remember Judas betrayed Jesus? And uh, he he obviously went and hung himself as a result. And I'm going to break it down. I believe Judas is in hell. I'm going to prove to you at least four scriptures that I believe that Judas is in hell. Was it because he committed suicide? Listen, I would never take the risk to find out. God gave me my life. I'm not ever going to take it. Neither should you. You shouldn't even entertain the thought. You should never even sit out of your mouth. Well, I, I think I'm going to kill myself. Wow, what a slap in God's face. And inside of your human spirit that knows right from wrong, you know that's wrong. So it's not based on whether he committed suicide. I'm going to show you, though, that I believe he's in hell. And, and, and here's the thing. We have this inclusivity. Oh, everybody's inclusive. He, got, he gets us. No, he got us. That's why he came down, fully God, fully man, shed his blood, because he recognized that we were all sinners. And no one is righteous, no, not one. And now, Acts 17.30 says, it's, God used to wink at sin, now he doesn't. He looks at us and he commands men everywhere to repent. You know what repentance is? Repentance is you cannot do things contrary to what God has laid out in Scripture and according to the moral law of things. God says, don't sleep with your girlfriend or boyfriend before marriage, then that's God's way. Then don't do it. God says, if you're married, don't commit adultery. God says there's only two genders. Quit dressing up and trying to be something beyond what God said. If God says marriage is between one man and one woman, it probably isn't love. It's probably a, an act of lust. And there's help. And you can be delivered. You don't have to be bound. If you're a liar, you're to repent. Don't cheat on your taxes. If you're bitter, you know, I've had people say, well, God just gets me. Uh, no, he got you. And you're just saying that so you can continue to be the fool that you are. In the foolishness of your sin, hardening your heart, being bitter, talking about people, unforgiving, whatever it is, we are commanded, all of us, to repent. And let me say this. Every preacher, including Jesus, when he came, he said, repent. Watch this. The kingdom of God is at hand. It wasn't if he got us, he would have said, hey, uh, I'm here and your kingdom has come to me. No, he said, my kingdom comes. I'm opposing anything that is contrary to how I am telling you to live. 
or anything that, uh, my, 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 I, I didn't say that right. I'm opposing anything that is contrary to the way that I told you to live. All right, I think I said it right now. All right, look here, I only got a, I got a lot to say in a short time to get there. Sounds like a song. <laughs> Men and brethren, this scripture must needs be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of who? David. David wrote many of the Psalms. So he's quoting David and quoting an imprecatory Psalm that David prophesied. And he says, by the mouth of David, David prophesied and spoke concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Now look at verse 20. Here's what he says. For it is written in the book of Psalms. Okay, these, you can't just ignore and pick and choose. If it says, break the teeth of the wicked, right? Shatter it. If it says, break the necks of, of, of the wicked, okay? What is he meaning, breaking the necks? How do we apply that today? Do you know that's why Psalm 3 says, let mercy and truth be about your neck? In other words, be a person that your every movement, your every decision, your every way that you treat yourself and people is with integrity, that's what Psalm 3 says. Let it be bound about your neck, mercy and truth, so that you will find favor with God and man. I know people in business, they say, well, I just don't know why nothing's working out for me. Well, let me check your neck. How much integrity do you have in your business dealings? Are you tithing? Are you giving to God? Are you cheating? Are you lying? What, what, you know, people wonder why they don't have the favor of God over their life. Because they make shortcuts. And when it says to break their necks, it's literally saying that the authority will have no power. You, you remember Eli, the priest in 1 Samuel chapter 3. He was so corrupt that he was stealing from the people. This is why people say, well, I need to see the church's offerings and, and, and have reports. God always deals if there's corruption in the priesthood. He'll, he'll deal with it. He hasn't changed. And he judged Eli for stealing from the people, but he judged them also because he wouldn't deal with his kids. His two sons would sleep with women right out in front of the front doors of the church. Can you imagine? And he just looked the other way. And the Bible said that Eli went and sat on his seat and fell backwards. He was a fat man and broke his neck. You know what that meant? His movements... His headship, he had no more headship, he had no more power. So think about all these people that want to get into office, school boards, uh, right? And, and they want their neck movement, they want their power, they want their headship. No, Lord, we break the power of anyone that's trying to come in, that their movements is going to promote evil. All right, how many are you getting this? So it's written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate. Notice, Peter personalizes it. He says, uh, his, and he's speaking of, of Judas, and let no man dwell therein. So you could pray it this way. Lord, let his habitation be desolate. Lord, we are asking that you would begin to empty seats in the Congress. You would begin to empty seats in the Senate. You would begin to empty seats over our judiciary, our Supreme Court, and the courts. And let no one with wickedness and betrayal sit therein. You can pray those prayers. You need to pray those prayers. We've got an election coming. How many hear that? Now, what's amazing about this, look at Psalm 69, verse 25. Peter's standing up and he's quoting the imprecatory psalm. It says, let theirs. Notice it was theirs, but Peter said, let his. He personalized it. He said, Judas, let his habitation be desolate. And let no one dwell in his tents. He was saying that Judas came under judgment. Now let's, let's look and see if Judas is in heaven or not. Look at Matthew 26, 24. This is why it's very serious on how you walk and who you align with. Matthew 26 says, The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe unto the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be good for that man if he would never have been born. Well, if he got saved in the end, he wouldn't have said it. He would have said it would have been good that he wouldn't be bored, but in the end, it's going to turn out all right. No, he's saying, man, this man is going to be doomed for eternal hell forever. I've had people say, well, why don't God just, you know, get rid of the devil and get rid of hell? Well, you got to understand the spirit realm is eternal. Once God created man in his image, an eternal spirit, you never die. 
And, and God, a holy God, cannot have sin dwell in his presence. So he made hell for the devil and his angels. And those who rebel against him that do not receive him. Because of the eternal spirit, it has to go somewhere. Right? So there's one scripture. Here's another one. Look at Acts 1. I think this one says it right here. Verse 25. Acts 1, 25. He said, uh, you want me to quote it? Okay, or, or 23, uh, 25. He said that he may take part of this ministry and po- uh, apostleship. So he's still talking about Judas. From which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to whose place? His own place. He didn't say so he might go to heaven. He may go to his own place. In other words, the, the place that he deserved, the place that he excluded God, the place where he sold out to the devil. All right, look at another one. Look at John 6. Look at what Jesus calls this one. This is why when you pray, Jesus answered and said, have I not chosen you and one of you is a devil? Man, President Trump calls people names. I just don't think he should do that. Well, Jesus called uh, Judas the devil because he's acting like it. If you're going to act like a bird brain, you probably are one. Okay, you all aren't ready for me. Let me hear it. All right. See, this is what, I, I can't believe that there's evangelicals out there. I will not vote for him because of his tweets and, you know, he just calls people names. D- do you call people names? Do you cuss in private? Yeah, you do. You know you do. You heathen fool. No, I'm just teasing. So it's all, we're always quick to point out somebody else's fault. We have to be careful of a religious spirit. All right, let me show you the last one. Look at this one, John 17. This one, I think, says it. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. And those that you gave me, I kept or I preserved. None of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that was Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Don't play with your life. And be careful if you walk with Jesus that you don't wind up in hell someday because, you, like Judas, you wouldn't change. I know this is the thing that I think gets on God's heart the, the most is uh, Christians that compromise. We shouldn't even, we, we should not even be having to argue about Donald Trump. He's, what, 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 what do you want to argue about? He stood with Israel. God said, stand with Israel. He said he's a Christian and Jesus Christ is his Lord. The difference is his relationship and his walk with God is on public display. Yours may not be. But boy, if we'd follow you around, I wonder what we would come up with. He stood for the right for life, what God likes. He he said out of his own mouth, we need Christ back in our nation. I don't, I don't, I don't get what people don't, I I don't understand. I don't understand Christians who will absolutely defend evil. I mean, I remember there was a movie that came out years ago and it was uh, about uh, somebody being paid a million dollars to go commit adultery. And there, there are some people in our, they don't go here anymore. Kind of glad because they probably would have been troublemakers later on. But I don't play. I don't mess around. So I was preaching and they said, well, pastor, you know, I take offense in what you said. We watch movies. I said, well, name one. Name one that you watch. Well, we just watched one called uh, something affair. I don't remember what it was where you could sleep around for a million bucks. And I said, what, what, what is entertaining about that? Are you entertaining the thought that you're going to go commit adultery? Is that why you need to see the movie? Why do you need to put that in your soul? You know, I, listen, I, I like movies, but I'm very careful. I don't want to see a bunch of murder scenes in front of my eyes. I don't want to sit through a movie that takes my Lord's name in vain. That's why I hardly go to... Uh, sporting events because I have to always correct people and I don't mind doing so. I tell them, shut your filthy mouth. Sometimes they've yelled out, Buddha, D-A-M-N. 
And they look at me. I'm like, yeah, why don't you say that? And see if any Buddhists mind, but I mind. I'm a Christian. Jesus is in my heart. He means everything to me. He died for me. He died for you. But oh no, we just, we just let stuff come in. And, and then if you get a righteous preacher, try to tell you, oh, he's just against movies. No, I'm against ones that don't better you. I'm against ones that make you, instead of being a radical Christian, you blend in like you're gray. I'll tell you another one. Antifa shows up. BLM. Marxists throwing bricks through black businessmen's windows. And I didn't see any black Christians standing up saying, uh, what about their black lives? I didn't. This white man did. And they called me a white supremacist. I'm like, excuse me, I'm standing for the black man. They're not. Because Christians have bowed down with too much complacency that they've become deceased, de- de- deceived in knowing what's right and what's wrong. They call evil good and they call good evil. And if you stand for good, somehow you're evil. But we'll go vote Schumer in or cackling Kamala. The problem is, when you have a problem, you have a real problem. (laughs) All right, let's go to Acts chapter 8, verse 9. Listen, they don't play out there. I don't play in here. All right, let's go. So I want to show you another example of Peter using imprecatory statements. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those that despitefully use you. He said, you've heard it before in Matthew 5, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those that despitefully use you. If someone hits you on the cheek, he said, listen, don't get revenge. Turn the other cheek. He only mentioned two cheeks. You have four. It's up to you if you want to use all four. But usually after the next one, you're done. And if you're a good, good, you kind of let it braze by your cheek and then you knock them out and you shatter their teeth. All right. So, because they drew first blood. All right. Now, anyway, I'm only teasing. You know that. All right. Now, let's just go. But there was a certain man in closing, as Pastor Doug starts making his way up here, because I'll just preach the rest of this next week. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used what? Sorcery. And bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one. All right, stop right there. You know what makes most people not effective in their walk with, with God or walk in life is pride. Man, I know people today. That as soon as they got their break, as soon as they got notoriety, man, they forgot how to just be real, how to be genuine. We had somebody come up to me of notoriety, and I'm not bragging on me. I'm just trying to tell you. They, they came to me and said, Hank and Brenda, you guys are so genuine. You're so real. I said, yeah, I know. I still clean up dog poop. Okay? Just because God called me. Just because the Lord was the one that has our ministry reaching millions, I didn't ask for it. I didn't even want it. But I'm not going to compromise who I am. I still vacuum floors and pick up dog poop and say yes, man, to a wife of 35 years. But there was a certain man. Okay, I already read that. He himself was some great one. So he's full of pride. And to whom also they gave out heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because that of a long time he bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. Stop right there. I'm going to show you. He believed, but he wasn't converted. This is why he doesn't get us. He got us. So I know people that pray the sinner's prayer to get the preacher off their back or the Christian I know people that pray the prayer, but then they live like the devil. I remember 
my, uh, my good friend, Bishop Jackson, uh, he's in heaven now. And he said, so I called him Bishop Jackson. He said, yeah, he goes, but Hank, he goes, you know what? He said, in some circles, being a bishop, man, means you get special privileges. I said, oh, you mean like, you know, the favor of God? He goes, special privileges. Some bishops manipulate their congregation and sleep with their women because they're a bishop. I'm sitting here going, what? Yeah, and some bishops steal the church's money. I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, and in some of those churches, they come in and they raise their hands on Sunday and then they go out and they live like the devil, but they got to get to church on Sunday morning because they got to repent. Okay, you, you, you are in the same category of Simon. He believed or prayed a prayer, but there was no heart change. This is why it's a lie. He gets us. They want you to adapt to progressive or permissive Christianity. He gets us so much that he has to adapt to my lifestyle no matter what it is. That's wrong. Every man is to repent everywhere. I don't think you like me anymore. So sorry. But, but uh, so now I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you this man didn't make heaven. History tells you he didn't make it. And you keep reading. And he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Look at verse 14. Now when the apostles were at Jerusalem, they heard uh, that Samaria had received the word of God. They sent Peter and John. Let's skip to verse 17. And they laid their hands on them. They received the Holy Ghost. Look at this warlock. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. So he obviously heard them speaking in tongues. He said, give me this power that on whoever I lay my hands on, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, now watch this. This is imprecatory. This is imprecatory. Okay, this isn't him coming against his enemy personally. He was a sorcerer. He was bewitching a lot of people. He was controlling the whole region from men, women, married, single, young, old, in between. And Peter, by the Spirit of God, pointed his finger at him and said, your money is going to perish with you. So he's saying, you are going to go to hell because you thought that you could buy the gift of the Holy Spirit and, be, and purchase it with money. Keep reading. Verse 21, you don't have any part in this lot or this matter, this utterance, because they were heard him speaking in tongues. He's saying, man, you have no part in this. You, you, you believed, you prayed the prayer, but dude, you're going to perish. You're going to go to the very Satan that you are getting your power from. For your heart, notice it always comes down to the heart. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. And he repeats it again. It has to have heart change. You can't just pray the prayer. It has to hit your heart. And if it hits your heart, guess what? You don't want to keep cussing because God gets you. If you really have a heart change, you don't want to cuss. You, you don't want to misuse the Lord's name. If, if, if you really have a heart change, you don't want to stay out of church. You want to go where you can learn and grow with God. Right? If you really have a heart change, you don't want to go out on Friday nights and party. If you really have a heart change, woman, you don't want to get on social media and show off your body. That should be reserved for God and your spouse someday. Not so that every man can lust after you so that you can have some swanky show up because he's lusting after you but doesn't know how to love you as a woman. But you gave him every reason to love you like a hooker. Where in the world am I? For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Look at verse 22. Repent. Oh, 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 oh. I guess he doesn't get us. Peter, you are a bigot. Repent, therefore, of thy wickedness. Because his wickedness was affecting a lot more than just Peter. And pray to God. Now underline this. If perhaps, that is a scary word. You know what that word is in the Greek? It's A-R-A, -A, era or ara. 
And it literally means a negative consequence. It literally means judgment. In other words, if perhaps, it's conditional, it's based on you. But because it's, it's translated A-R-A, it's translated that the outcome, he didn't do it. And I'm going to tell you, history will tell you he didn't do it. Repent, perhaps, is conditional that the thought of your heart may be forgiven thee. So notice what he does. He does what a lot of Christians do. For I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness. Okay, he was getting to his heart issue. You're bitter. You're unforgiving. And in the bond of iniquity. You know what bond of iniquity is? He didn't say bond of sin. He purposely said bond of iniquity. Peter did. When he was releasing an imprecatory judgment over him. He was saying iniquity because iniquity, the definition of it is purposeful sin. He's like, man, you believed, you prayed the prayer, but you are on purpose still sinning. You are still on purpose wanting to entertain yourself with pornography. Stop it. Well, I can't help it. Yeah, you can. Slam the laptop shut. Go tell somebody you're having problems and get help. But don't lust in secret so that it now becomes the bondage of iniquity. Where now it becomes purposeful sin. And now you, you're not just looking at it, but now you want somebody better than what you have. I perceive that you're in the bond of iniquity, purposeful sin. Look at verse 24. Look at what he does. And look at Simon's answer. Sounds like a lot of people that have come in my counseling office through the years. That's why I don't counsel anymore. He answered Simon and said, pray to the Lord for me that none of these things that you spoke come upon me. He didn't say pray for me that I change. Pray for me that I repent. Just pray that your imprecatory statement that I'm going to perish and go to hell isn't going to happen. But yet let me keep living in the bond of iniquity. Let me keep being a liar. Let me keep being unforgiving. Let me keep running my mouth against the pastor, against the church, against other Christians. Let me keep cheating on the taxes. Let me keep lusting and sleeping around without the pastor knowing it or the wife, or husband. Am I too hard? This is Bible. Okay, so he put an imprecatory st- I want a clean church. You know why? Because the Bible says the pure in heart see God. And I want to see God because we've got people in wheelchairs that need to get healed. We've got people that need a touch from God. And I, I want God's presence, man. I want it in my own life. All right, so now let me break this down real quick. I pray that it wouldn't come on me. Well, that's nice, but let me tell you about what happened to Peter. Or not Peter, but Simon. All right, let me tell you why he did not. First and foremost, go back to verse 22 in closing. He didn't because of the conditional word that is a strong indication and doubtfulness about repentance. But listen to this. The early church father, so you can, you can read about uh, Justin Martyr wrote this, Jerome, uh, Arrhenius wrote about this, early church fathers. Here's what they wrote about this man, Simon. They called him the troublemaker to the church. And they wrote and they said that he was responsible for Gnosticism. The, it, the writings described, remember how he thought he was some great one? No, no wonder he was, he was a narcissist, Right? And the origins right describe his heretical views and his self-promotion. He's known in history as Simon Magus. How do you remember uh, uh, the saint? His name was Simon Magus. Remember that? Yes. You ever watched the same with Bill Kilmer? I mean, no, nobody ever watched it? Oh, it's so early. You want some coffee or something? Okay, there you go. But being a term which means sorcerer, magi- magician. Now watch this. Simon also, history said, had Simonians. And they all held Gnostic errors. And many say that Simon is the originator of Gnosticism. All right, I'm going to give you one more thing. History of the Christian Church, volume 1, page 566, says that Simon was in constant opposition to the Apostle Peter until the time that Simon died. Yet he believed. And yet Peter had to put a stop to it said, you know what? I'm invoking the justice of God on you, buddy. Because you're affecting a whole lot more than yourself. That's why you need to show up at your school board meetings. Stand your feet. You need to show up and say, you know what? I'm not going to be silent. You're not putting that garbage in, in, in our libraries. 
My children are going to check it out. That's why don't you ever be afraid to stand down anybody when it comes to parenting your children in the right ways of God, especially in their gender. So we got to, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, next week, we're going to talk more about Peter. I'm going to break this that I just gave you down a little bit more. We're going to talk about Paul. You know, Paul commanded blindness over a sorcerer. Paul looked at uh, Ananias and uh, called him a whited wall. Why? Because he was trying to tell him that he didn't receive him as the high priest because Jesus, Romans 6, once and for all, went to the holy place and has become our high priest. Paul was letting him know. That's why we'll, we'll look next week what Paul called Ananias. He didn't call him the high priest. He called him something else because he was rejecting his pharisaical way, especially after Ananias ordered that Paul had his face smacked. Paul said, what are you doing, you whited wall? And Paul uh, declared an impeccatory statement. And